Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day three of Google I.O. How are we doing? <laughs> Tired. That's the, well, Good I party hope, last night. <laughs> well, I hope that this session will get you inspired and excited. I'm Anka Cotwell, uh, and I'm a developer advocate from Sydney. This is Lawrence Moroni, the star of Coffee with a Googler, uh, based out of Seattle. He's also a developer advocate. And we're on the uh, Google Maps API developer relations team. And today we have an interesting talk for you. We, we've taken a different approach to what we've done in the past with our APIs. But I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about the history of the Google Maps API. This is a blog post that we launched 10 years ago, and it was us announcing the Google Maps API. We were really, really excited to make the Maps API available to the world. But we were really impressed with just how innovative developers were with it. The types of experiences that you all built was just astounding. And that really inspired us to add more and more capabilities to the Maps APIs as time went on. And so just a, a, a quick sort of historic tour through this. You can see how the Maps API has changed. And these are clearly uh, the JavaScript Maps APIs. And this is where we landed on just a couple of years ago. So today, what we want to do is talk about that full set of APIs that we have, but from a, from a perspective of where do I get started? Which APIs should I use when I want to build certain types of user experiences? And to support that, we've developed a framework, a four-layer framework. And we're going to start going through these layers in a minute. But really, with this framework, you get to decide how much code you want to write and balance that off with what type of customizability you want. So I'm now going to hand it over to Lawrence, who's going to start walking us through this. Thank you, Anchor, and good morning again, everybody. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a really, really lazy developer. Uh, I like to do as little work as possible and get as much benefit from that work as possible. That's why I'm probably doing a talk at 9 o'clock in the morning after the party. So uh, when talking about building maps, the first level and the, the one that appeals to me a lot you know, in being able to do this is what we've been calling the delegate layer. And what the delegate layer is, let someone else do the work for me. In this case, if I want to build something that incorporates a map, I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to have Google do all the work. I don't want to do anything myself. And what technologies are available for that so that I can, I can have maps, I can have geo stuff in my application without me doing a whole lot of work, and in some case, not doing any. So the first one is, let's just use the Google Maps app. So if I have an application and I want to put a map into it, instead of embedding a map myself, I'm going to launch the Google Maps app. In Android, we do this using intents. So when I have an intent and there is a URI structure that works within the uh, Google Maps app, so if I say geo, colon, and a couple of numbers, anybody know what these numbers are? Pick me. Pick me. Go on, then. Latitude and longitude. Latitude and longitude. Ah. Which one's the latitude? Which one's the longitude? The first one is the Very latitude. Very good. It wasn't it with Google Maps? They used to be the other way around in the beginning, right? It was longitude, then latitude. I learned that this week. So if I start like with a geo call on something, and I give it a latitude and a longitude, and then I start up a map intent from that, and this map intent is set to use the package com.google.android.apps.maps, now it's a case of what Android will do is it will launch the Google Maps app for me. It will pass this URI to it, which is geo, colon, latitude, longitude. And that will render a map centered on that latitude and longitude for me. So now by just putting these four lines of code in here, I'm able to get a map of a location that I want. Lazy developer like me, this is great. I haven't had to really implement much. But because we're using this URI, and you can see it's prefixed by geo, we get the latitude and longitude. There's lots of other stuff in, the, in the, uh, the URI that we can do as well. So here now, I've added a parameter at the end, question mark Q equals restaurant. So go on, Anka, what do you think the Q is? Query? Query, very good. So I'm taking a latitude and longitude, and I'm querying for restaurants in that. And now the Google Maps app is launching. It's going to this location, and it's highlighting restaurants at that location. So say I'm building a travel app or something along those lines, and I want one of the activities in my app to be that people can see a map of restaurants. Instead of me building that for myself, the package is doing it for me. The Google uh, Maps app is doing that for me. But wait, there's more. It gets better. Now I can actually parse different real things. Like, so if I want to say, for example, do navigation, 
instead of, so say maybe I have a, a restaurant myself and I want people to be able to navigate you know, to my restaurant. Now, within this URI structure, I can say it's a Google.navigation question mark. Q was, Q was what again? Query. Query, thank you. And then I can specify to navigate to a particular location, in this, time, in this case, Taronga Zoo in Sydney, Australia. He's lucky enough to live in Sydney. He can go there anytime. I wish I could go because I really want to see a koala. And, and Anchor has taught me all about drop bears that drop out of trees, and they look like koalas, but they're really fierce. And uh, uh, something tells me they're not real, though. Are they real? They're real. They're okay. totally real. So uh, again, if I want to do navigation, and I want the Google Maps app to handle navigation for me, this is all I have to do. Very, very simple, very, very straightforward. And then finally, my very, very favorite Google technology. When I first interviewed for Google, one of the things they ask you is, OK, tell us your favorite Google technology. And you know, tell us some things about it, and you know, maybe how you'd improve it. And I'll, I'll, I wear my heart on my sleeve. My absolute favorite is Google Street View. So again, if I want to have a street view, like maybe a, I, I do volunteer work in Seattle, uh, where I live for a, uh, it's like a youth hockey group, and we have a couple of ice rinks. And ice rinks are really big, expensive places, so you have to put them a little bit out of the way. You can't put them in city centers. And sometimes it's hard for people to find the ice rink. So like something like a street view, so people can see, hey, navigate to this location. This is what it's going to look like from the street. This is our ice rink. And that kind of thing, that's where street view just works brilliantly. And you can also view inside places with street view, so you can see what it's like. So we put like a couple of our ice rinks, that the actual ice sheets that we did, like a surround view that you could navigate into with street view with that. And it's just, it was just fabulous to know people could see what the facility is like. And again, if I want to have a street view launch, all I have to do is create a URI like this, you know, google.streetview.something and two numbers, latitude and longitude again. And I'm, and I'm getting that, you know, getting all of that functionality done for me without me doing anything. Pretty cool, right? For lazy developers like me. Now, this doesn't, this doesn't just work with Android. We also can make this work with iOS. Now, not everybody on iOS has the Google Maps app installed, of course. So using URL schemes on iOS, we can do something like this. Now, in this case, you see I clicked that Launch button. And what happened is in this scenario is I did not have Google Maps installed on the emulator. I recorded this off of the emulator. So it falls back gracefully to Safari and uses Google Maps within Safari. Pretty cool. So let's take a look at what the code for that would be. Now, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit more old school when it comes to iOS. I'm an Objective-C guy. I haven't become a fan of Taylor Swift yet. So. Hey, they laughed at it. Uh, <laughs> That's one out of like 15. We, we, yeah, we, OK. We had a debate whether they would like that one, so they did. So, you know, so in Objective C, all I have to do is I'm going to create a string of my location, and it has the latitude and longitude in it. And then the URL scheme prefix for that, the same as you saw on the Android slide, where I'm saying it's com Google Maps colon slash slash latitude, longitude. Also, sorry, there was a zoom here. When you talk about maps, when you want to render maps, if you imagine the camera up in outer space looking down on the map, and then your zoom level is the closer you get to the map, the more detail you see. So this was zoom equals 14. So that view on the last slide that we had of New York City was like I'm zoomed right down rather than viewing New York City from orbit. So I'm just saying, you know, come Google Maps, here's my latitude, here's my longitude, here's my zoom level, and I'm going to create a URL out of that. If you're an Objective-C or if you're an iOS developer, how you will launch an application is you use the UI application, shared application, and then you open a URL on that. So now I've tried to open a URL, which is prefixed by com Google Maps. Now, maybe this URL will open. Maybe it won't. When it will open is when the Google Maps app is installed. When it won't open is when the Google Maps app is not installed. So in this case, I say, hey, if it fails, I'm just going to fall back to HTTP maps.google.com slash question mark equals, and then my location parameter from the beginning, the latitude, longitude, and zoom. And that's when Safari opened, went to Google Maps for me, and showed that particular location. So again, Google Maps is really doing everything for me as a developer in this case, and I'm writing minimal code. It would be great if the Google Maps app was installed, and then I get all the richness from that. But if it's not, I still have the maps within Safari itself, within my browser itself. So I think this is a really, really cool technology. And again, for lazy people like me, you know, who just want to delegate, who want to have Google Maps do everything, you know, we have these things that we can do, the URL schemes, the activities that we can launch on Android, and that type of stuff. Hey, Lawrence, what if I don't want users to get out of my app, and I want to keep them in my app? Then we incorporate. OK, tell us all about it. <laughs> 
So here is a case of, I just want a simple map. I want the simple map. I want it in my application. As Anchor said, I don't want to drive people out of my application to the Google Maps app, or I don't want to drive them out of my application to the browser. How do I get a map in my application, and how do I make it as simple as possible to use? Well, let's take a look at what we have. First of all is the Web Static Maps API. And it's a pretty cool API where, I mean, if I were to summarize it, you give a URL, you get an image back containing a map. But it's not just going to be a standard, boring map that's the same as everybody else's. It can be customized. Here you can see the one on the left has been customized and has been themed. So it's this really nice RT black and white. So maybe if your site has that kind of design language in it, your map could do the same thing. The center one is a satellite image. I don't know where it's of. Can anybody guess? Is that Iceland? or I'm not sure. But it looks really pretty. There's lots of fjords there. And so again, you can set it to be a satellite map. So maybe you want to, I don't know, maybe you want to show off like landscape. It's a real estate app or something like that. And you want to show off the beautiful landscape around the house. So those kind of things. You can show satellite images. And then finally, you can also set it so that you could have a routing, so a, you know, how to get from A to B. So again, if I go back to my example that I was talking about earlier on of the, the hockey organization that I volunteer with, this one is really, really great for us because we want on our website to have people be able to find where our rinks are. And it's like, here's navigation from various points. And so it makes it, you know, it's a static map that we're embedding. I don't have to worry about embedding logic in a website. I don't have to worry about putting lots of JavaScript and all that kind of thing. I have a URL that I call. I could iframe it in, and I get what I want on there. So that's the Web Static Maps API. Again, it's not taking me away from my site or not taking me away from my app to something else. It's just giving me in line what I have, and I'm incorporating Google Maps functionality into my own site. Then there's the Embed API. And here's where we take it a little bit further. So instead of it being a static map, I'm getting all the functionality that you'd be used to if you were using Google Maps in the browser independently. So things such as roads, navigation, traffic conditions, all those kind of things that you see on the left. It's just iframed in in this case. And it's, I'm, the source is google.com slash maps slash something. And I can get whatever I want based on the, what's available in the API. As you can see on the left here, I have navigation around London. And as you can see on the right, I have my favorite technology. It's Street View. And here is an example. This is a really beautiful restaurant. I don't know where it is. Do you know where that is? I don't. It's, okay. uh, yeah. So we've like, for example, we have this really beautiful restaurant. So if I was operating a restaurant and I wanted people to see how beautiful it is inside of my restaurant, instead of just telling them or instead of having static photos on my site, I could embed the street view of the inside of my restaurant so people can pan around, they can zoom around, they can step around inside the restaurant, and they can really, really get an experience for what it would be like to be in my awesome restaurant. So I hope the cooking is as good as the, the pictures. So then there's autocomplete. So now, have you ever gone onto a phone and you've had to start typing in an address? And it's like, you know, typing with thumbs the way that you do is like, I'm, I want to go to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. It's like, what's the address of that? I have no idea. It's somewhere in Scotland. Um, the autocomplete, what that will do is once I start typing, in this case, I was typing Hogwarts, and now I'm typing the Eiffel Tower. What that's going to do for me is once I start typing, we have a places API and we have places data in Google Maps that will then come back and start auto-completing based on what I'm typing. If I start typing HOG for Hogwarts, all of the Hogwarts around are going to be listed, and I can pick one and get address details back. If I, anybody ever been to the Eiffel Tower? Did you know the address of it before you saw it on this slide? Right? We don't know the address of places like that. You, know, you go to Paris, and you see this great big tower, and you know that's the Eiffel Tower, or you ask people how to get there. But if you want the address of it, it's really, really hard to find. So if I, in this case, started typing Eiffel Tower, then the autocomplete, if I'm dropping the autocomplete widget into my application, that's going to give me data back about the Eiffel Tower once the user selected it. And that's how, on this one, I was able to find the address of it and the latitude and longitude of it as well. And the code for this. Oh, it's cropped off here. It's not cropped off there, thankfully. So the code for this is on Android. You know, we have this uh, place autocomplete widget, and we start an activity for that. And then that activity, once the user has finished typing in stuff, is going to get a callback. So on the left, the activity result code that you can see at the bottom, that whenever you're in Android, if you start an activity and you get a callback, that callback is always going to contain data. And you're going to have data, and you're going to cast it into the relevant object. And in this case, you know, my data that's coming back from me is actually going to be a place. 
and the place is something in the, that's an object within the places API. And then from that, I can start querying metadata around that place. In the example that I showed, the metadata was things like the address and the latitude and longitude. But for example, if it's a restaurant, you can start seeing photographs of it. You can start seeing reviews. You can start seeing links to the site, menus, all of those kind of things. And there are tons of entities, not just restaurants. There's everything from A to Z, from accountants to zoos available within that API. And then on iOS, it's very, very similar. You can see the pattern is the same. On iOS, on my autocomplete press button in this case, I'm going to start a view controller, which was a, I have to read it out, it's a GMS autocomplete view controller. And what that's going to do is that's presenting the UI, as we saw in the video. And when the user types in something, gets an address back, they've selected the Hogwarts that they want to go to, then this will call you back with a did autocomplete with place. And from that, you can then pull the place details. And you can see the last line of code there, as I'm just saying, you know, a string place details is the place name itself. So while the user might have just typed hog for Hogwarts, they were able to get all these details back, and the name was being returned in one of them. Very, very straightforward, very simple code for lazy programmers like me. So next is the place picker. So now, for example, I'm in a location, and I'm walking around in downtown. This is Rome, I believe. So if I'm walking around in downtown Rome, and I know that there are places around me, wouldn't it be nice if I had like an app that I could take out, and I can start looking at all these places, and it's, it's like highlighting interesting things for me from cafes to tourist sites. And as I move around and I touch on them, and I get the details back about it, and if I play it, we can see this in action. There we go. So like I'm moving around, and I see, oh, look, this place. It's updating my location. It's finding things that are around me. I'm able to drop the pin on some of these and find out interesting details about it. Uh, or I can find like the places that are near me. You'll see the list at the bottom updates that what's available around there. I pick some of those places, and I get details about that. And I can do all of this, and I can get all of this functionality out of the box by writing very, very little code. So let's look at the code. Looks very similar to the previous slide, right? You know, in Android, I'm going to start an activity, and this activity is going to be a place picker activity. And whenever in Android you start an activity, the user has done something, all of that functionality that you saw is built into that place picker activity. And when I get a callback from that in the data, then I can pull, I, I can cast that into a place. And at that place object then has all the properties and all the methods that will allow me to pull information about that place and light up my app with them. Maybe my app is showing menus, or maybe my app is showing photos, or those kind of things. And all that data is going to be available there. All I had to do as a developer was use the place picker activity, launch a place picker activity, catch the callback, parse the data. And in iOS, very, very similar, very, very straightforward. There is an object called the GMS place picker config in the SDK. Sorry, the, and the place picker config is used to configure details about my place. And then I launch a GMS place picker object passing that configuration. And that configuration might be, you saw my example, I was in Rome. The configuration would be like location about Rome, that type of thing. I will launch my place picker. And then I get a callback from that. And the callback, as you can see, has a GMS place object. And that GMS place object, again, has all those uh, properties that I can parse for name, address, all those goodies. So I'm the lazy one. He's the hardworking one. So uh, we're going to move on to the next layer. And that's like when we start moving deeper into integration and we start moving deeper into using mapping functionality in our applications. And Anchor, can you take sure. it away? So as you can see, the journey that we've been taking you on so far is about getting you started with the Maps APIs with little effort and adding little bits of user experience to your app. And now we're starting to get to the points where you really want some more customizability, and you want that flexibility to really tailor the experience. No pun intended for his Taylor Swift comment earlier. Um, and you can tailor I'm, it in Swift. Yes, you can. So I'm going to start off by talking about the JS Maps API v3. So this screenshot here is actually from an app we just recently wrote. And so for those of you that are here at, uh, at I.O., please go check out the Geo Sandbox, because what we did was built a bus tracker. So if you took any of the Google buses to get to and from I.O. this year, you'll notice that there were some QR codes on the window, and you could actually track your journey. And here, we're using the Maps API v3 to provide an experience that you can see is very customized. We're using styled maps to use a color scheme that's actually matching the theme of I.O. for the year. But we also have custom markers. We've used polylines at different points. 
And actually, we've integrated other APIs as well, which I will talk about uh, a little bit later, the, things like the Directions API. I really like how the map itself fades into the background so that you can focus on what's important, right? The bus stops and where the buses are now, that they really pop. Exactly. And it's this API that it's, it's taking you beyond just dropping a map in your, in your app. It's really st styling the, the experience to match whatever else you're building around it. Because the map may only be a part of your app or uh, or, or site. On Android, we also offer a similar API. And where Lawrence has had his chance to tell you what his favorite API is, which was? Street View. Anybody uh, else love Street View? Oh, only a few people hey, love Street you. View. There you go. <laughs> um, for me, my favorite API is, is actually a subset of the Android and iOS APIs, and it's the camera. So, here you can see a top-down map. You're used to seeing it before. You've seen it many times. But on Android and iOS, we give you really, really good control of that camera. So have a look at this video here, and you'll start to see that what we're doing is really changing the position of the camera. And this is downtown LA. And now that we've zoomed in far enough and changed our angles uh, of, of view, you'll see those 3D buildings pop up. This feels like a real place, right? It's not that top-down map. In fact, if you think about maps, we've been using them for hundreds of years, and they've always been top-down. In the digital age, we get to provide such amazing user experiences. And so, to me, this is the, my favorite part of it, because when I build an app with, with a map in it, I really want the user to feel like they're there. And you can actually achieve this sort of effect with, again, very little code. Here's the Android code. We uh, create a camera position uh, using the builder. Um, bearing will, will basically help us rotate as to which, which degree we're facing. Target is obviously the location that we're looking at. But it's tilt that makes the big difference to me. So tilt basically helps us move our camera and face it in uh, and, and offer some depth. And that's how you're starting to see more of the horizon. And that's really, to me, the magic uh, value that, that made that sort of experience in that last demo possible. And of course, zoom level brings you in or, or further out, as, as Lawrence described. But you'll notice that as we were moving from, uh, in downtown LA from point to point, the camera was smoothly moving there. And that's because we weren't calling move camera. We were calling animate camera. And the nice thing about animate camera is that when you pass in a new uh, camera position to it, it will work out what the difference is between the current viewport and the target viewport, and it will animate nicely there. It will animate each of those values that you see up there uh, with the camera position builder. So please do use it. It's, it's, it's a great way to provide good navigation through your apps. Of course, with iOS, you are able to achieve the, uh, a similar type of effect. Here we are, we've zoomed in far enough that, again, we have those 3D buildings. Um, we're able to zoom in further and interact with it and so on. And so this, to me, is really those maps coming alive and providing that, that customizable experience that I talked about earlier. The code for iOS is, again, very, very similar to Android. We have this GMS camera position object. We're able to pass in a bunch of parameters to it. Uh, here, our tilt is actually called viewing angle. But we're able to customize that, too, and then we, we pass it in to get a map view out of it. So we iOS developers are a bit more literal. <laughs> You like lots of characters <laughs> in your parameter names. We've got beautiful keyboards, so we like to type on them. <laughs> so uh, moving right along, Lawrence. Um, another thing that you might want to be doing with your maps is that you want to put markers on there. But like, if you look at this, screen, this example here, we have some restaurants in Rome. Uh, and here, I actually did a search for Italian restaurants in Rome. It turns out there's quite a few of them. I was shocked. Um, <laughs> This is not a great user experience, right? Like You want your users to be able to explore and discover restaurants, but putting in a 1,000 markers on a map, it's, it's not much fun for anybody. So instead, I'm going to show you marker clustering, uh, which we provide with a library called Android Maps Util. And you'll see as we zoom in, those num numeric markers start to split, and more markers come out of it. And then when we zoom out, these markers come together and form into clusters. It's actually much, much nicer to be able to see this kind of zoomed out view where you know where there's uh, lots and lots of markers around. And, and it's very obvious to users. And it's great for perf as well, right? Yeah, so, performance, absolutely. Yeah. Like I mean, in this view, instead of seeing 200 pins and tracking them as you pan the map around, you're seeing one blob. 
Absolutely. The cool thing about marker clustering is that implementing it often resu results in less code than when you're managing your markers yourself. So let's have a quick look at that. Uh, as I mentioned, we have this Android Maps Utils library. So in our Gradle configuration, we just add that library in. And then we have to go and implement this interface called cluster item. So in our case, we had a list of restaurants, and we would have had like a, a Java object that was the, the restaurant itself. We just implement this interface called, uh, that provides this method get position, and it just returns this latitude and longitude. So you're probably already tracking this data anyway. Just add that interface, take out all of your, your own marker code, and instantiate a cluster manager. Uh, you're associating the cluster manager to the map, and you're also saying, telling the map that you want the cluster manager to get these callbacks whenever the camera, uh, the viewport changes, or if the user is clicking any of these markers, so that it's able to manage, you know, like as the, the, as the zoom levels change or the viewport changes, it's able to work out what needs to be done with your markers. And then you just give your cluster manager those, those data items. In our case, they were restaurants. So you're just passing in uh, a, an object that implements that interface, and that's it. It'll manage the rest for you. You'll get that experience with just these few lines of code. It's, it's pretty amazing. But of course, marker clustering isn't the only way to deal with lots and lots of markers. The other one is heat maps. So here what we've done is kind of tried to see in Rome again where those restaurants are. Because if you think about it, where there's more restaurants are really where the more crowded areas are. It's where more tourists are going to be. And if you are a tourist, it's probably where all the attractions are, right? So here, if we have a look at the demo again, as we zoom in, it's generating new heat maps. Those, uh, those heat maps start to split up as we zoom in because, again, we're starting to see the density of these uh, various restaurants. And it just like, results in a, I mean, this is, I, I clearly am not a designer because I've been told my choice of colors wasn't <laughs> quite the best. Uh, but it's totally customizable. Uh, I intentionally went with this sort of standout set of colors to show you that you can cu customize that gradient that's shown there. And the code for this is similar to what we saw for marker clustering. Add a library, the, an the same Android Maps Utils library, but this time you're instantiating a heat map tile provider, and you're associating the, your data items with it, and then you're telling the map that my tile overlay will be provided by that heat map tile provider. That's it. You don't need to do anything more than that. It will manage the rest for you. So that's pretty cool. And that's some of the customization that you get at that integration layer. But many of us developers are like, you know what? I don't want you to manage any of your, the visualizations for me. I know what I'm doing. I just want the raw data, and I will be able to put it on a map. So orchestration is really about you wanting that raw data and, and taking full control. So let's have a look at some of the, the APIs that enable that. And it really starts off with the web services that we provide. I'm going to talk about the directions API to start with. So remember I mentioned that bus tracker that we built earlier? That bus tracker, what it's doing is that we've stuck an Android device on each of those buses, and it's reporting its location to a Firebase real-time database. And then our web app is consuming those locations. We know where the buses are going to go, and we're feeding it in to the Directions API to give all the attendees at I.O. accurate times as to how long it's going to take for you to get to I.O. or get back to your hotel from I.O. And by accurate times, we're taking into account things like the traffic conditions, the real-time traffic conditions. And for buses that are not taking off till later in the day, we're using a feature that we call predictive travel times. So we're able to forecast how, what the traffic conditions are likely to be like when you leave, maybe this afternoon, to go to the airport, to go back to your homes. So the Directions API actually gives you tons and tons of great functionality. And actually, in terms of your own apps, if you're a fitness app and it's about running or cycling, we can give you walking directions. We can give you uh, cycling directions. We can give you public transport directions as well. You can also customize your waypoints. So maybe you're getting from point A to point B but you have to make some stops along the way. So imagine you're building a logistics uh, type app, uh, asset tracking type app. Waypoints really, really help you there. So Directions API is a great way to get that information, and you can get it back as JSON or XML, and then parse it and, and, and display it on, the, uh, on a Google map, whether it's on the web, Android, or iOS. 
Lawrence mentioned the Places API, Auto Picker, uh, Auto Complete, and Place Picker earlier on. We actually have a web service for this as well. And don't worry too much if you can't read the, the text on the left. The idea is that with just a little bit of, a, like with a, a fairly short URL, we're able to give you a ton of information about the places that meet that criteria. So here we've just asked for restaurants in Sydney. And you can start to see that we are getting a lot of information. It's, it's paginated as well, so you'll get uh, a few hits at a time, and you can request the next batch as you go. Places API is really, really amazing, because we don't think of our location in terms of latitudes and longitudes. As Lauren said, we mostly don't even think of our location in terms of an address. We use an address when we're trying to get somewhere specific, somewhere that's unfamiliar. But really, often we think about where we are based on its name. Because as, as people, we, we tend to think, think of our location by name. And the Places API provides a fantastic uh, set of tools to be able to help you bridge that gap with your users. So it's really, really worthwhile looking at this web service. On Android and iOS, we also offer a native Places API. So where you saw earlier, we had autocomplete and place picker. Those were predefined experiences. They were widgets that you could just drop into your app. But maybe you want to customize your, the look and feel. right? You don't have to use those place pickers. I, I highly recommend you do, because there's very little effort to use them. But let's say you have a special need where you need the underlying data on those devices. So we have these APIs. So um, you'll see on Android and iOS that they have similar names, but uh, the, the, top, the top ones, get current place and current place with callback, they give you the same functionality. They list a number of places that are around you. And so I'm going to show you this demo on the, on the left-hand side here. And what it is is that we're driving along the freeway, and the list at the bottom is just the list of the place names, as well as the value that we return to you that we call likelihood. And that's, uh, you can think of it like a probability. What is the probability that the user is at that place? So let me show you what that demo looks like. It's really quick. Um, and particularly, look at that first item. You'll see the, the probability values of that one are changing, while the others are sort of moving up and down. Let's have a look at that. It's a very short demo. So as we're going along this freeway, the device is using all of its sensors. It's using GPS. It's using Wi-Fi scans. Um, where you have beacons, it's able to use BLE beacons, uh, Bluetooth, sorry, uh, beacons, to give you your location quite accurately. But we're able to put other smarts in there as well. Are you really going to be at that coffee shop at 1 AM when that coffee shop closed at 9 PM? Unlikely. And we're able to put those sorts of smarts in in determining the user's current place because we have that set of data in the places database. And we've used machine learning to really tune what those likely values are. So suddenly, with just, again, these few APIs, you're able to get very accurate information about where the user is and then present them with options. Maybe your app is something that helps the users explore their surroundings. And so get current place is a great way to show here are restaurants, here are tourist attractions, maybe when we were in Rome. And get autocomplete predictions is the underlying API that we saw that sort of powers the, the autocomplete widget earlier. So you, as your user is typing in their keystrokes, you can say, well, what are the autocomplete predictions for this? and present them how you like to, the, to your users. We love our smartphones, but one thing that we take for granted is actually the GPS sensor in them. We use it a lot. We rely on it a lot. But what you might not realize is that the GPS sensors in our phones are not very accurate. So Lawrence took a drive around the Sydney, uh, Google Sydney office here. I and promise he... I was sober, although it doesn't look like it. <laughs> He was driving around our Sydney office here. And if you look at those orange points, he was actually on, in a car on the, on the road. Yet the sensor on this phone is telling us that he drove through a park on the field and through a casino. Now, I've been worried about Lawrence's gambling <laughs> problems, but I didn't think he would do it in a car. And I was right. And so what we find is that this was a common problem. Developers came to us and said, look, while, I'm, while I know that my users are, are in a vehicle, we know they're on a road. This GPS tends to be noisy. We, we, kind of, we know that we need a straight line, but the, the GPS points tend to be more zigzag. Can you help us out? The roads API helps you achieve this. So now what we do is we take these orange points, we throw it into the roads API, and we plot them here as green points, because that's what the roads API is giving us back. And you'll see now these points are actually following the road. 
In fact, we can insert with the Rhodes API, you may get back more points than what you input because when you're taking curved roads, you want to have a few more points coming through so it's tracking nicely and you're able to plot that well. So let's get rid of these noisy orange points. But I wanted to show both of them to show you the delta between them. Uh, and here, this is, this, is more, this is exactly what Lawrence's route was. So the Rhodes API is a good way for you to be able to snap your, uh, your drivers to their roads. Now, we have tons and tons of web services. Uh, we've just covered a few of them. But the thing is, we want you to be able to consume them in the languages that you use on your server-side components. Let me, get, let, you, let me forewarn you that with web services, you should not consume them directly in the mobile apps. They're designed to be consumed server-side. They're protected by an API key, and you don't want that API key being distributed in your mobile apps. So please do proxy them through the web servers, through your, uh, your, your cloud servers. But we have some client libraries that we produce for Go, for Java, and for Python, so that you can consume them in whichever, whichever of these languages that you prefer. If your favorite languages aren't on here, let us know what you'd like, and we can take that back to the team. Before we wrap up, I want to thank you for being here, and I want to show you something new that we're kicking off today, or just recently. We've had some feedback in the past that you would love to know more about what are the things we're working on. So we're now announcing a new beta program. So if you could go to this link and sign up, you have the opportunity to join a community of other like-minded developers. And we will reach out to you as we're launching betas of new and upcoming features of the Maps API. And this is, of course, across all, our app, all of our platforms. But the best part of this is that they're pre-launch features. So your feedback helps us to shape the product. We want to take that feedback on board. We want you to tell us which use cases it's meeting well, which use cases that we're maybe not meeting as well. We want you to give us feedback on the quality of it. And in turn, we're able to share with you a bit more about our roadmap. So as of today, so if you're watching on YouTube, uh, as of today at, uh, at I.O., the form is open. But we will be taking developers, accepting developers in batches. So if you find uh, at some point that that form is closed, don't worry. We will open it up over time as new uh, APIs are being launched. I hope today that you've had a good look at the various APIs that we offer. And you can see your own apps and sites slotting into one or more of these layers and seeing which of these layers are most relevant to your development. Thank you very much. Thank you.